Well, thank you, Michael, for sending us an engaging video presentation. It's shocking to realise that those in transportation, government and the NHS are not only prime targets, but are potentially more vulnerable to their digital transformation journeys and cyber criminals are eager to take advantage of digital growing pains. Well, and now it's time for us to move on to our second discussion securing the public sector, safeguarding the network. 2020 saw a rapid shift to online services, which gave cyber criminals more targets and even greater opportunities to infiltrate vulnerable networks. The cybersecurity landscape must continue to evolve at the accelerated pace of cyber criminals if we're to combat it. It's predicted that the total number of distributed denial of services, DDoS attacks, are to double from 7.9 million in 2018 to more than 15 million by 2023. If the public sector doesn't continue to secure its networks, it could be left defenseless if targeted. In turn, this leaves the sector susceptible to financial losses costing millions in recovery. We just heard from Mary, 10 million, as well as bringing down essential services needed by the public more than ever before. Well, here with me to discuss the connection between ransomware and DDoS and share vital steps needed to keep next work secure are Michael Nadasdi, Programme Manager, Fraud and Cybercrime at Hertfordshire County Council, and NetScout speaker, Andy Burgess, Vice President. As for the last panel, don't don't forget to submit your questions using the live Q&A function on the right hand side of the screen and if we get some questions in I will ask as many to Andy and Michael as possible so uh, lovely to see you both gentlemen thank you very much good afternoon we have hi there we have a little bit of uh, a luxury here because often we have four or five panelists and so we've got a little bit of time to breathe and uh, Andy I'd like to start off by asking a little bit about more about you and NetScout and and, and what you do if I may yeah, good morning. Uh, so my name's Andy Burgess. I've worked at Netscout now. I, I originally joined in 1996, so I've been here for a very long time. Um, and I've obviously seen a, lot of, seen a lot of changes in IT and a lot of change in the company I work for. We, we started off maybe, there were 40 people back in 96. It's an American company. Um, and it was all about looking at service assurance, how well things were performing on your network, you know, how your applications were performing. Over the years, it's changed a lot. It's still led by the same one of the founders, um, and so it really is a technology company. There's about two and a half thousand people now, so it's a much bigger organisation. Um, <clears throat> it's listed on Nasdaq, and really, it's got a number of business units. We've acquired a number of business units, one of which is particularly relevant for today, called Arbor Networks. They're the leaders in DDoS protection, um, and almost every service provider every tier one service provider will use their products to protect um, organizations and individuals against DDoS attacks. I guess the other part of our business, uh, and it was interesting here in the previous um, panel, is all about looking at threats, insider threats, changes in behavior, what machines are doing. And so we have an investigation tool, um, a cyber investigation tool. And then we also continue, half of our business is still looking at service assurance. It, our website's up and running, our application's running. And it's, as I said, it, we've seen huge changes in the way things are working in the last uh, 18 months. And, and that's, you know, from our side, has been a really interesting change. You know, there's some good bits, some, some undoubtedly some very good bits, and that some very bad bits have come along with it. I was about to say that you've seen the digital landscape change dramatically over the last decade, but probably over the last decade, but particularly the last 18 months. Andy, just give us a sense of, of that change from your perspective. I think where we've seen the most change is this working from home. So, so people have high speed connections. Events like this could have never happened or would, would, weren't happening really 18, 22 years ago, 18 months, two years ago. Um, this sudden change to using the internet for real time access really has been the difference. Um, we were talking earlier, you know, if things went down before, you know, if, if a website went down and, you know, we talk about, say, say my daughter's at college and I can go in and I can make sure she's done her homework and I can see her attendance. If that system was down for 15 minutes, I would usually assume it was my, my probably my mobile phone provider had an outage. These days, though, you know, I'm constantly on video calls. I'm constantly using, you know, video conferencing, these sort of things. And so all of a sudden we, we rely on the Internet for real time services. We've seen the benefits in schooling. I mean, you would never have thought five years ago we could almost overnight send everybody home 
and, and have them access some sort of education via remote learning. And the same is true for banks. We, we saw one global bank literally change, you know, they're, they're working from home policy where it was kind of a bit of a, maybe not a luxury, but something that they did and they supported on the side to it, it became the standard way of working for over 150,000 people. And they had to adapt and make that happen in a month. And, and, and they did, and, and you see the changes like that. And so IT has really enabled some of these changes. What we're not seeing is, the, is going back to how it was. The, there is a new normal, that's clear. I, mean, I still go up to London occasionally, much less than before. But, you know, you can see the station car parks aren't full. You can see London's not as busy. People are, are, are having this work-life balance, and there's a difference. There aren't so many people in London. There aren't so many people commuting. And, and even we have offices in Bracknell. There, there aren't so many people going to the offices as there were before. Well, it's nice to think that perhaps there can be some positives out of the uh, pandemic, um, you know, in that better sort of work-life balance, which is a whole different conversation. Uh, Michael, welcome to you, to uh, our discussion today. I'd love you to give us an insight, um, if you can, into your role at Hertfordshire County Council and how you got into the fraud and, and cybercrime area. Yeah, well, it's a, probably a slightly different route because, you know, um, Essentially, I'm uh, aligned with trading standards as a as a, a part as a function of the county council, and um, you know, trading standards and the police and crime commission of Hertfordshire. The, the police and crime crime commission of Hertfordshire is particularly um, interested in supporting business. He was a you know he ran a small business himself, and he's he has a amongst other things quite a, quite a focus on business crime and. In conversations with business uh, and us, um, cybercrime came up as this sort of leading, um, you know, what, what is it that's, that your business is worried about? Uh, and it was cybercrime um, right at the top of the list. So the organisations got together and essentially created this role to um, write a cyber strategy for business for Hertfordshire and um, and deliver that and the, the strategy at first was was um the thought was well, you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna go and fix this cyber crime then and um you know it quickly became apparent that that isn't an option um you know you could put every law enforcement officer in the on the globe doing nothing but cyber crime and, and you still would be able to put a lid on it um what we have to do is communicate to businesses that they are a target and then they need to take the threat seriously and they need to take action. They need to do something about it. So that's um, that's what we set out to do. And that's what we've been doing over the last sort of three, three or four years. And what are the sort of things that you like from the last three years, Michael, that perhaps, you know, would be interesting to people in our audience today? What are the sort of learnings that you've come across that have helped make you safer at Hertford, should you think? The first... When we speak to businesses, I mean, it is, like I say, it's just slightly different because our, we're sort of, this is an outward facing project of the council um, communicating with business rather than us defending yeah, HCC as, itself. Um, but there are sort of three, three, uh, if there are three things that we say to, to businesses, it's uh, train your staff, train your staff and train your staff. Um, <laughs> because, you know, it's, we, we can put all of the technical safeguards we want in place. We, 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 we're coming, coming from a crime, pers crime prevention perspective. We're in law enforcement constantly facing that battle is we have a target, we have something of value and criminals target that thing of value and they get hold of it. So then we put up a barrier around it to protect it and they work out how to get over around that barrier and get to our valuable item so we increase the barrier or we put changes and then they work out a way around it and we add it and it's always that way around because whatever defenses you put up someone somewhere tries to work out a way past those defenses and when they do you have to create new defenses because you can't anticipate we try to anticipate but if you know what i mean eventually once they get through once they get through the only people that can defend your business are the are the staff you know there was you know, we've just seen a couple of weeks ago that I think it was a software development company that lost $55 million worth of cryptocurrency. Now, these 
you know, th those two factors, these are people with IT up the eyeballs, right? They are, they are as IT knowledgeable as you can get. And they were done by a phishing email. I, I, I remember staff gave the, the keys, the, the, you know, the cryptographic keys to the crypto into a phishing, through a phishing email, business email compromise, CEO spoofing. So if it can happen to them, it can certainly happen to a social worker or a, you know, someone working in, in the public sector in ATC. And we have to upskill our staff. We have to train our staff to make sure they understand it. And personally, I, I don't think just, you know, a, a 20 minute sort of online PowerPoint show once a year really cuts it in that, in that respect. Andy, would you agree with those sentiments? You know, the top three things, training, training, and training. Yeah, yeah so that, that we're forced to do, like, it's more like one hour of uh, very specific training on various things. And, and I can say that, you know, it's the same, uh, especially if you work for the same organisation for a long time, it's, just, it's very similar every year, and you can almost go through mm -hmm. the motions without paying yeah. any attention. And we've seen, it's interesting, we've seen some of the banks specifically try and target their own staff and i think we're going to see more and more of this of you know who's vulnerable to actually clicking on the links and I, I i saw a bank in another country do this and what was amazing from top to bottom from board of director members all the way down you know that they, they they clicked on this and it was a really easy thing it was it, what they offered was you know you're coming to the end of your bandwidth click here to get some extra bandwidth on your mobile phone and, and they sent this out to all their staff and, and they probably got something like 20 percent of people click on the link and start typing in their details and it was an amazing thing and you know they've had all the education so so you still you know education is great but but we we still somehow have the, you know lots and lots of cyber breaches are because of individuals um and we can put in lots of tools we can you know part of our function is to investigate what happened and, and when we see that you know often it is an individual and they haven't done it for any bad reason, right? They've, they've completely made an accident, they've taken it, they've read the email, they've trusted the email. And, you know, I think it's, it's a very complicated world. It is a complicated world. And certainly on a personal basis, I, f I find it's a world that's got very sophisticated. And I'd like to think of myself as fairly switched on, more switched on than, than my lovely mum, who's nearly 80 and replies to everything when she gets emails saying, your daughter's in trouble, she needs 200 pounds, click here. And unfortunately she's done that. But but I've been conned by it because you know emails from banks and things like that are very sophisticated. The stats though, Andy, that we read in the introduction are alarming to me. I mean, the prediction that the total number of distributed denial of services attacks are to double from 7.9 million to more than 15 million by 2023. I, I found that quite shocking. In respect to DDoS, what trends and changes have you seen since the start of the pandemic? So, so with respect to DDoS, I mean, if, if we take a step back and look at what a DDoS attack is, so really a DDoS attack is an attempt by somebody or, or, or an organization to, to take down an online service or make it unavailable to the users. So. It may be a bank, it may be, you know, a, an online learning experience for a child, it may be a, a council website. Um, and there's a number of ways they can do that. Um, they can send high amounts of traffic to, to that service, and, which will just overwhelm, completely saturate the links. Or they can send some very complicated things to try and break things, you know, to fill up tables and, and just exhaust the, the infrastructure. And so we, we have tools to try and mitigate that. Um, your service providers also have some tools that will, will step in and do that as well. But in terms of the actual numbers and the trends over the pandemic, I think, you know, we've seen over time a gradual increase. Just as people's internet speeds at home have got much quicker, your speed on your mobile phone has got much quicker, the size of internet of DDoS attacks has got much bigger. They, they leverage vulnerabilities in the internet to, to do what they call amplification attacks. Um, but, you know, the largest attacks, are, you know, are in excess of one terabit a second, which would it, would it you know, unless you happen to be a service provider or somebody on that sort of scale would, would completely overwhelm all of your services. But that's something to put it in you know, layman's speak is, is the equivalent of like 50,000 online movies all being downloaded in one go. Um, we have a problem in our house with internet connectivity. And, you know, once we get to about three or three movies, it, it, the whole thing starts to fall apart. But so, so to any sort of public sector, you know, these sort of numbers are, are, are at the level where it would take down the service. And then 
as I said, the, the issue we've got then is, you know, what sort of things are being attacked? We, we are seeing specific attacks against VPN services. So people working from home, you know, VPN connections are relatively easy. I, I would say to everybody, whatever you do, don't start naming your VPN connection like, you know, council VPN dot whatever. It's, you know, these things get picked up, they get taken down and, and it, people almost do it for fun. Um, we have also seen a lot of extortion attacks. Um, one interesting one, which we were monitoring at the time, actually was one in um, a European bank. And it, it's funny, it made me laugh on the earlier panel where they said most hacks happen on a Friday night. <laughs> DDoS attacks are designed to disrupt everything, right? So they, they, they don't happen on a Friday night. Um, However, in this particular case, what happened was there was a DDoS attack and it, it was a relatively small attack. It, you know, it, it was big, but it wasn't as big as we see. And, and what we saw with that was, um, you know, an attack happened and it was about 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning. So, so um, there were no IT staff working and, and it was designed to show that they did it. And we actually have recruitment on place and we mitigated this attack. We saw it, but they then immediately get an extortion demand saying, look, we attacked your system. And unless you pay us X amount of Bitcoins, we're going to attack you again. And, and they ignored the email. Again, I, I would say to anyone, you know, if you've got issues with, with extortion, speak to NCSC. You know, they're the, they're the people to go to, I think, for the UK, especially in public sector. Um, don't pay it, whatever you do. And then, you know, they actually had an attack and it was at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning or, or 5 to 9 on a Monday morning, clearly designed to cause maximum disruption. And then that attack was something like, um, you know, it, it was probably eight times larger than the previous attack. And all of these are thousands of times larger than they would normally expect. And again, we, we mitigated it, but it's quite interesting to see, you know, that there are clearly banks all around Europe that were taken out during the pandemic. Um, and, and banks aren't the only ones being targeted. We We've seen, you know, when we were talking earlier about this, you know, schools being targeted specifically. We've seen um, what's interesting is we saw a lot of hospitals in France being targeted during the pandemic because they were of high value during the pandemic time. And, and, and you know, lots of people can't understand why you would attack a hospital in the middle of a health pandemic. But of course, the governments want to try and protect those hospitals. And so, and so there's more money, there's more budget available. So extortion attacks you know, are really held up against those. Michael, what experience do you have of uh, DDoS attacks? I should have actually been brave enough to, um, to ask Andy in the first place, what exactly is one? Because one tends to try and presume that one knows, but it is a new world to a lot of us. And what do you say when you're advising businesses what, what are your key things that you advise on in terms of, of those kinds of attacks? Well, it, it's more general. We're, we're, we spend a lot of time working with, with SMEs, with smaller, smaller businesses. So DDoS attacks are much, they're much less likely to experience DDoS attack. They're more exposed to, like I say, business email compromise issue. They're the people looking to do uh, mandate fraud and CEO spoofing. Those, those are typically the um the, the crimes that they're experiencing however the advice actually is much the same um which is uh is pay someone else to do it for you which is we're constantly uh, you know uh, constantly encouraging businesses you know saying you've got to take your side more seriously you've got to you've got you need to have these measures in place and these safeguards and people balk at that because they're not IT experts, and I think it's the it's the infosec industry has has its own role to play here in in the way it communicates because people do tend to get baffled by tech talk. You know, it's a bit like saying I, I don't do maths. You know, so I don't do computers, <laughs> which is fine. You know, if you if you were a, a, a cyber expert, an IT expert, you'd probably run an IT business, not your not the business that you do run. Right? You, you're an expert in the field that they run the businesses in. And I say to I say to them, I said, don't try and do it yourself. You take your car to a, a, a garage because you don't know how to fix it. You got you, you pay people to cut your hair. You don't cut your own hair. I mean, <laughs> some of us with <laughs> less hair, maybe you do. But as a, we pay experts to do this stuff for us all the time. Everything, cook our food, to cut our hair, and to fix our cars. Pay an expert to manage your IT security for you. So go to a managed service provider. Have them do your network monitoring. Have them put in the technical safeguards that you need to keep your business operational. Um, 
and take advantage of the of the sort of cyber insurance opportunities out there to for for mitigation when when the worst happens if should should that sort of thing happen so the advice in terms of employing experts to to make sure you're getting the the technical side of stuff right and taking uh, measures to make sure you're able to get back on your feet when things go wrong those 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 messages apply across the board whatever the sort of cyber threat is i suppose it's not afraid to ask is it you know as we sort of going back to mary's example at red car in cleveland that all came as a bolt out of the blue i think it was the mm. most serious attack on a council that Britain's seen. And, mm. you know, I think it was a very steep learning curve there. And what came across is that Mary wasn't afraid to ask. And, you know, she found herself in uncharted waters. So we mustn't be embarrassed mm. about that, must we? We're, we are in unprecedented times. And through home working and all that kind of thing, we're all experiencing the digital transformation, perhaps much quicker, Michael, than, than we might have done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we as an organisation, um, I think we were quite um, far forward in, in, in philosophy in that we were encouraging staff to work from home where possible already. This, it was about a transformation of the workforce and saying things for like sustainability and, you know, energy usage and all that. Um, and, uh, you know, less travel, less pollution cars traveling to work. So we've already, there was already a program in place of the way we work, which was trying to encourage people to do that. But uptake was quite slow and managers were reluctant, you know, to, to probably feeling they were concerned. Can I manage my team effectively when they're not actually in the same room as me? You know, how does that work? You know, it's all a bit too sci-fi. And then we had to do it. And then it ha overnight, we had to make it work. And we found people can are still productive and you can still manage a team. You can still have a meeting um, and make stuff work without, you know, them knowing that you've got your pyjamas on underneath the table. That's, that's okay. <laughs> I, I haven't got my pyjamas on. I have got a pair of jeans Nor on. Nor I, I promise. I, promise. I think as well, <laughs> these, these events, of um, our events like this are normally live. They're live in Manchester or Birmingham mm. with a live audience of 500. And, you know, the decision from, you know, the people behind these events is that we're going to carry on. We've booked... 18 virtual events for next year because there are advantages to to having a mix we're building here on this a digital platform which people are really really enjoying so mm -hmm. there have been many many positives from this kind of new way I mean we go back to the beginning of the pandemic I remember when we were all asking you know what's a zoom and you know, mm -hmm. what's a, you know most people didn't do teams calls zooms all that kind of thing um Andy we took touched a little bit there on service providers you know such as bt and you know giving their customers um ddos protection is that enough protection do you think i think you know, we, we supply those service providers and i think what they do is great and and you you do need it if, if you if you have saturation level attacks the only people that can protect that and clean that are your upstream service providers and you know in the uk for for public sectors, particularly in education, we have JISC. Um, there's the likes of BT and, and, and many other service providers in the UK we, we have as customers, we're fortunate to have as customers. What we have seen, though, is these systems were really built to protect against, you know, a, a large-scale attack, um, and, 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 and they take a little while to step in. They, they can, you know, something like BT is optional. Michael just mentioned, you know, you need to outsource this. You, you absolutely do, right? You need to tick the box and, and ask for protection if you if you if your particular business needs it. Um, what we have found though is as we've really transformed to this real time environment, which which really wasn't there two years ago, that we do need. You know, we we found lots of cases where we have to put equipment on site. Um, that can be run remotely, and so we have some service providers that can re run it remotely. But you know, it gives you that instant mitigation so that you don't have, you know, if, if one of us was subject to a DDoS attack now, we would see that you know, we'd be knocked out for 10, 15 minutes and it would destroy this panel. But it, the same happens in schools, the same happens in universities. Um, and the same happens for online meetings. You know, if, if, you're, if you have, say, a planning meeting in a council and, and somebody was to attack that meeting, you could really disrupt things. And, and these meetings are important. They have to happen. And, and so we, we have seen a big uptake in that sort of protection of these real time events, um, which, is, which is something which is relatively new. As you said, we, we would have done this in person two years ago and, you know, everybody would have been there. And, and, and it's, I guess, like switching the lights off. It's, it's somebody comes along and attacks it and, and there is, you know, it, 
it destroys the meeting, it destroys the whole workflow. Michael, are there any examples that you can give, um, perhaps more extreme examples of the disruption that cyber criminals can cause? Well, it's the, the interesting thing is no, no matter um, what the sort of um, the actual activities are and that the, the are disrupted, it all comes down to money. It all costs money. It costs the cleanup can cost more, way more than any financial loss. You know, if, if, if you can see why sometimes there are many, I mean, there are many examples and we, you know, we don't recommend it, um, but there are many examples where the ransom gets paid on a ransomware or a DDoS attack um, because it's actually cheaper than trying to deal with the, the, the horror of the, the cleanup, you know, especially when you've got, um, you know, slow infiltration and you've got nothing, you know, a DDoS attack is just happening there and then, but when you've got something where you've just like a ransomware where everything's shut down, that's horrific. But, you know, we, it, it, it generally comes down to money. We had a, um, a conveyancing deal with a solicitors who lost, the, the, person, the person buying a house lost 1.4 million pounds just just because of a simple change of bank details mandate fraud um, in Hertfordshire, and that's you know if, if we talk to businesses, you know the average. I mean, it's difficult to get the numbers um, confirmed, but you know the average cost of a, of a cyber attack um, is so many thousand pounds to a small business. And they can't afford, afford to lose that, but losing um, seven figures—that's uh, quite another. That's a, a matter altogether. And of course, Michael, it isn't money, is it either? Looking for Mary, you know, all, all the social services sector of, of her council fell apart and leaving yeah, I mean, elderly people without any help. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, the, the, I mean, we were chatting about this, Andy and I were chatting about this uh, just before before the, the panel started. In the terms of like a, a, the website going down, if, if the HCC website went down for a day, it wouldn't stop the bins being collected, or actually, we don't do the bins, but <laughs> the local council that, but it wouldn't stop, you know, the, the education happening. It wouldn't stop the roads. It wouldn't stop highways being out doing the roads. It wouldn't stop our social care taking place. It, but it would affect, um, you know, the people uh, who were just trying to get information at, at that given time. Um, but if it were, if the service, if our systems were brought down for any length of time that could cause huge problems to the community and to the, the people that we run our services for. That would be, that would be deeply problematic. Um, and in both cases, um, you know, the, you've got the money to put it right, but then the money again to fix those problems that that caused in putting that right, because it's not it's not just simply the cost. It's it's resource, you know. It's staff time. You've got to go out and fix all these problems um, that have been caused by it. And the only, you know, we we keep saying to everybody, we 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 can't fix this for you. You have to protect yourselves. And it's the same with the, with our public sector. It's prevention is. For every, we talk about this in across community safety with you know um, drug and alcohol treatment or any other but a pound spent on prevention is equivalent to nine ten pounds spent on on clean up you know yeah that's a very <laughs> strong message I mean Mary talked about losing ten million and managing to recoup four which four million which brings us nicely Andy on to central government um she talked about central government and asking for financial help I mean what central government help is there around cyber security for the public sector I think Mary, Mary um provided, provided some details of where she got help from um we we as an organization actually we we interact with NCSC that they run a thing called I 100 industry 100 where they take experts from industry um, and this is partly to fill a skill shortage I would say where but you know they can take <clears throat> um, people from industry and they run specific projects so NCSC are very good at, at doing this they provide lots of good advice the in other interesting one we've seen recently um, is one of the LEPs has set up a business cyber center partly funded by DCMS, um, and their their remit is is much like Michael's, I suspect, but it's it's in a bigger fashion where they've actually set up this cyber centre, this cyber hub for their region, 
and their idea is to get experts in and to do lots of training for SMEs um, and to try and do that. Because across, you know, e even if you run a very successful business um, or, or even an IT business, we, we have a skill shortage. That's clear in cyber. You, you know, it's, it doesn't matter how many people we train. And, you know, I, and I see it all the time in public public authorities or government departments where a huge amounts of effort goes into training and then, you know, the people generally, they, they can leave, they can get higher paid jobs in private. And so, and so you know, it's a never ending skill shortage, especially in public authorities. Um, and so from that point of view, I think, you know, Michael said earlier about outsourcing it. I think that's a good idea. I think, you know, outsourcing the things is very interesting. It was it also touching on, you know, the impact of some of these things. I mean, we deal with lots of of the global, the largest global companies, sometimes they, you know, a ransomware is very in your face, you know, your computers are locked, it's all, you know, everything's happened. When we're talking universities, especially research-based universities or to um, R&D focused companies, their intellectual property is their key asset. And so lots of what we have got involved in is protecting those key assets. Um, so if a ransomware locks all your computers, your computers are locked, it's, it's hugely disruptive. Um, if, if you lose all your intellectual property, then that also causes many issues. And there's obviously been lots of cases recently in the news where intellectual property has been lost. And th this can be to other nation states. It can be nation states style attacks as well as individual companies. And, and that that another place where we where we really try and help companies identify what's going on uh, and, and go back and investigate. You know, so, so if you think you've got a breach where come from and everything else so it's it's, a, it's an interesting but, but scary place to be it certainly is um, just final thought michael i mean as protection gets more sophisticated presumably cyber criminals get more sophisticated and more inventive as to how they get round the protection like we talked about never ending skill shortages is it a never ending cycle that we are just going to have to get smarter and smarter and smarter and this is just going to be part of life now in our digital world yeah that's that's absolutely right i'm not i'm not sure i could really add to that helen because that really i mean i'll try but it that really <laughs> is exactly exactly the situation um uh you know it, it, like i was saying before you know we build we build a defense around our assets and someone tries to break through those defenses and and that's that's the war now and we and we, like we see with phishing emails you know you're talking about your, your mum falling prey and it you know it, anybody can anybody can, can can fall for social engineering but they're not getting any the point is that these both phishing emails ddos attacks um ransomware none of it is getting less sophisticated right and none of it's going backwards it will only get more sophisticated it's gone are the emails about the you know the african prince who's trying to smuggle eight million dollars into your bank account although interestingly those emails still do, do go out because anybody that clicks on those one of those it gets put on a suckers list and and becomes a target which is shared on, on amongst criminals for like, these these really are easy marks you know but generally speaking you know that they these are organized crime gangs that are behind these these sorts of attacks it's not just you know the image of some yeah you've still got some teenager in a hoodie trying to bring down nasa because they want to because they can um but th that's it's that's a vast oversimplification this is this is big business this is business and all businesses are looking to expand and improve and do things better and make more money and and crime is no different so yeah we have to get um, better at spotting the stuff we need to get better at dealing with it better at managing it and um, it's it's not going away until um, until some something replaces technology this is this is where we're at now you gave a very good answer there you uh, rose to the challenge michael and and uh, added to my question beautifully uh thank you very much michael and andy for an in-depth and a detailed look at this topic it really was nice actually for a change just to speak to to two of you and have a little bit more time to 
to explore a bit about your backgrounds as well and how you got involved in what you're doing. So uh, it's been an interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, nice to have time to breathe. Uh, lunch is coming up soon. So if you have chance, jump into the meeting hub and continue to gain connections and build your community with our fellow delegates or chat further perhaps to those you've already met. I hope this morning has given you food for thought and some topics to break the ice. The connections you build now are there for you to use into the future, logging in at your leisure and exchanging, exchanging views with not just the delegates here today, but future registrants too, building your community. Our speakers can obviously offer you plenty of knowledge. I think we've learned a lot this morning, but a significant source of knowledge on our platform comes from each and every one of you. So do feel free to share your insights too. A reminder, we have a great and rewarding prize for those fully taking advantage of community building. Those in first, second and third places will get to donate in their name to the Magic Breakfast or More Trees. Our next session kicks off at two o'clock, uh, so uh, I look forward to seeing you then. Perfect.